Most of you are familiar with us. Uh, NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We used to be the National Alliance, actually we never were, but sometimes I would say the National Alliance for mental illness. So there's a there's a distinct difference with that. NAMI is the largest grassroots uh, organization in the country engaging in su uh, su supporting people and their families with mental illness, uh, uh, providing education and also advocacy. Some of you may have taken our workshops. We offer a family to family workshop for family members and significant others of people who have a mental illness. We also offer connections, which is a peer support group. For, and these are uh, support groups are facilitated. And uh, that meets on the first and the third Wednesdays. And we can provide you more detail uh, about those two workshops, again, family to family and also connections. And, uh, and we're also a available to, to talk with you, to talk with groups and uh, any other organizations or any venue in which you would like more information about NAMI. Uh, just uh, very briefly, I mentioned that we're NAMI uh, Jefferson County. We do have a website and I would refer you uh, to that as well. We're one of 13 affiliates of Washington NAMI and by that I mean Washington State NAMI uh, spread around the state. And uh, we have a, a vigorous chapter here on uh, the Olympic Peninsula and we would encourage you to join us as a member or out of interest. If you would like to get on our uh, email list, uh, uh, send us a, 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 a private uh, chat and we'll, sh we'll see that you do that. So again, uh, we're, we're very pleased to see all of you this morning and I, I think we have a, a good workshop set up, set up with you. Val's already mentioned that we'll be sharing the presentation uh, along with uh, Robert Komishar and Robert is 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 particularly unique because he'll be sharing a lived experience with us. So uh, Val, if you want to add anything to about NAMI, and otherwise we'll turn and and commence with the uh, content of our workshop. Okay, and uh, we, we do have a website, so um, you'll get that information later. If you want to go to the website, you should be able to find information about our support groups and then eventually other uh, workshops and trainings that we have. So our goals for this wor workshop are to provide awareness and education and prevention skills as well as intervention skills. And so in doing that we'll, with the intervention skills, we will also talk about a plan for the future because when uh, you're involved in a situation where someone is suicidal, you have to have a plan. So we'll be talking about that as well. And usually we do a survey here, but we don't have enough time for that. So we're gonna do that. Um, uh, skip right on by that. Uh, just quickly, the definitions are suicide is death caused by self-directed injurious behavior with the intention to die as a result of the behavior. And suicide attempt, by the way, these in, uh, definitions are important because they become part of statistics. Now, suicide attempt is a non-fatal self-directed potentially injurious behavior with the intent to die as a result of the uh, behavior and it might not result in injury at all actually. Suicidal ideation is the thinking about considering or planning suicide and those those are general definitions that we use uh, across the country. It's helpful to put um, suicide in a, a quantitative context, if you will. And so we have uh, a couple of sets of numbers to share with you. Uh, first, uh, and these are rather startling. Um, I think most people are surprised by, by the data. Uh, as you can readily see on your screen there, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death uh, at 13.26 persons per 100,000, which is, which is quite startling. That's a lot of people that take their own lives. In America, uh, 48,344 uh, Americans uh, took their own lives, died by suicide in, uh, in 2018, which is the most recent year that we have data for. And for every completed suicide, there are 25 attempted suicides, which is, which is absolutely striking. Um, and then turning for just a moment, if we may, Val, to uh, the state of Washington. The leading uh, cause of death in Washington are, is 
is it's the eighth leading cause of, of death in Washington. And of course, uh, I mentioned just a moment ago that it's the 10th leading cause of uh, death in the, in the United States. So we have the dubious distinction of having a, uh, a higher suicide rate. Uh, and these are all per capita based on 100,000 here in the state of, of Washington than you find uh, nationally. It gets completely, and let's go on to that next slide if we may, Val. Uh, it the the picture here in in uh, Jefferson County is even more uh, devastating. You can see there that in uh, 2017, and this is the most recent year that we have data for, 11 people uh, took their own took their own lives, and that that brings us to a rate of, of 42 per hundred thousand individuals, which is way beyond what the national excuse me what the state. Uh, rate of, of suicide is and also way beyond the, the national rate. And there are uh, a variety of reasons uh, for that. And, and forgive me, you can see 15.37 and 13.26. Uh, and again, our rate is around 40, 42 uh, per thousand, which again is absolutely startling. And there are a variety of reasons for that. And then before I, I talk about that, uh, uh, veterans, as all of us are painfully aware, are far more prone to suicide than than many other uh, populations. Uh, again, these I, I'm familiar with these numbers, but they always startle me. Veterans are are taking their own lives at a rate of 20 per day, and you can do the math to see how many that is per month and and over the course of, of the years. There are uh, a number of reasons why why suicide is so prevalent here in the peninsula. Uh, isolation is one of them. And, uh, uh, and I, I should add that just from a data point of view, we have a relatively small population base. So it doesn't take too many uh, incidents to drive up that number. So don't keep that in small, do keep that in mind. But it doesn't, it doesn't take away, even in the slightest sense, from the from the seriousness of the challenges regarding suicide here on the the peninsula. Uh, and uh, Bill, I don't know that there are any other factors that we want to add of the three things that I talked about. We, uh, Val has put up the age rate, so I'll turn to Val. Uh, let's go to Val to talk about that. So the age rates are different uh, and they're, they're quite interesting because if you go all the way back to the year 2000, which is the beginning of this graph, you'll see that the highest rate of suicide was in the 85 or older range. And now that has changed and we're finding that the age is going down. So it's uh, the highest rate now is in the 45 to 54 range. So that's quite interesting. But what is also interesting is you'll see the black line in the middle that is the younger age, 15 to 24, and that is definitely rising. So that's something to really be concerned about. The other thing is the um, differences between homicide and suicide. You can see that back in the year 2000, there was a higher homicide rate in the country than there was a suicide rate, but that has all been reversed. And since 2010, the suicide rate has been decidedly higher than the homicide rate. So we're doing a good job at uh, preventing homicide, but not such a good job of preventing suicide. And then this one just talks about the ethnicity, but you'll see that it's clear that white people are the ones that have the most incidences of suicide followed by the American Indian. So it's interesting to look at the uh, demographics of it because um, the figures are definitely different. And by method, what's really clear is that firearms are the method of choice, if you will, and when it says suffocation, which is the blue part here, they actually mean um, hanging. So um, it, while there are four uh, common methods, the most common of all is firearms. So you can see where getting firearms out of um, the picture that that is a good prevention in itself. 
Okay, now we're going to talk about warning signs, Patrick. Yes, uh, thank you, Bob. And uh, you, uh, there are there's warning signs manifest themselves in a variety of ways, including uh, the uh, talk and what we're talking about. And, it's, and so, what that suggests and what what demands, of course, is that we listen very closely to the people around us, uh, what they're saying and and how they say it. And their, their behavior can also be uh, dramatically uh, changed or, uh, or in some cases, uh, if uh, suicide, uh, suicidal ideation is a, is a continuing uh, condition, then you'll, their behavior will, will reflect that. And of course, mood. And a major driver of, of, uh, of mood, of course, uh, is depression. Uh, and uh, many of us have experienced depression. Many people uh, find themselves in a situation mm -hmm. where their depression becomes in increasingly uh, deepened, uh, leading perhaps to, to uh, clinical, uh, uh, excuse me, clinical depression. Uh, and we live in a, in a place where we have lots and lots of cloudy skies. So of course that will add to the burden of, of the feeling of depression. And uh, there's a, you can take a look at the slide now that Val's put up there. Uh, being a burden to others, many people that are, are suicidal feel like they are a burden to others. And, and that feeling of being trapped, uh, I think we've all felt that. I know that I certainly do. And, but it's more than just being trapped for a few moments or a few hours or even for a day. Um, this goes on. And unbearable pain. Um, I uh, know, have known uh, several people who have committed suicide. And, and if they do leave any kind of indication uh, about why they chose to take their own lives, unbearable pain is often something that, that uh, we read about. So uh, un, an unimaginable, unimaginable pain. And I know that some of you have had perhaps experienced that. And a loss of hopelessness, hopelessness uh, no reason uh, to live. Uh, loss, and uh, we hear that from, from various people and, uh, and the individuals that are referred to have, some of them have actually said that a, a loss of hope is actually, is, is a profound, profound factor in all of this. And uh, people talking about killing themselves. And again, uh, listening is so key to all of this. We're talking about suicide prevention this morning and listening to what people are saying. I, I know that my listening skills can be honed a bit more, and, but it's always important anyway to listen to what people said, and particularly if we have a sense that they are, that they are uh, prone to killing themselves. So listening, and we'll talk about that as we go uh, along. Uh, I've referenced these, but let's uh, just go over them again. We talked about depression, a loss of, a loss of interest uh, in daily events, a loss of interest in our lives and ability, inability to focus upon, uh, on them, and rage. Uh, my uh, twin brother committed suicide and he was a very, very angry, angry individuals, uh, very angry uh, for the course of the years. And as, as I look back on that, it's been 20 years since Mike uh, shot himself. But when I look back uh, about some of the uh, behaviors that he evidenced, uh, rage was, was quite among, was among them. And, uh, and also, and these are not all of the symptoms, but these are the primary symptoms and irritability. And there's a word for that, uh, akathisia, uh, AKA, uh, T-H-S-I-A, and I think that'll pop up on our screen here in just a moment, but irritability and, and uh, uh, people lashing out and, and uh, seemingly being very defensive and, and uh, reacting to what perceives to be a, sort of, a, a, sort of a, a, an, aggressive uh, an aggressive way. And, and that can uh, present itself in varying degrees depending upon the individual. Uh, we also uh, see, an, and not surprisingly, an increase in the use of alcohol and drugs. We call those uh, co-occurring disorders. That is to say, when a person has a mental illness uh, combined with the use uh, of alcohol and drugs or substance abuse, that's called a co-occurring disorder. And that nomenclature has become rather common over the last many years. I think the message is there is, uh, there is let's not separate the two. Uh, they, they occur together and they, they will aggravate uh, one another. Um, people who are uh, considering killing themselves or thinking about killing themselves or reach that position, look for ways to do it. The, the internet has afforded an ample opportunity, if you will, to, to uh, find all sorts of ways to kill themselves. You can go Google anything you want and there's no lack of, of ways, ways to do it. 
uh, acting restless, uh, recklessly uh, without regard for oneself, maybe driving a, a <clears throat> car, for example, putting yourself in a vulnerable kind of situation uh, here in Port Townsend. We have bluffs along the beach and uh, uh, people will walk to the edge of the bluff and think, wow, that would be a, a good way for me to take my own life. And, and then, uh, and, and again, I think you've noticed many of these things uh, if you have people that, that are part of your family or friends or others who uh, have suicidal ideation. And that leads to I isolation. Uh, one, of the, one of the most lethal uh, factors in our lives when we have a mental illness uh, is we become isolated. And that's, that's pretty natural because we don't want to be around people and other people don't necessarily want us to be around them if we're if we're upset we're quick to we're quick to anger uh, sleep um, I uh, sleep is is uh, uh, people who are who are depressed tend to sleep a lot or they don't uh, or they sleep too little uh, we've learned over the years that sleep is a is a major factor in our overall mental health as well as our as well as our physical health so paying attention to people's sleep patterns is extremely uh, important uh, people who are committing uh, who, who are going to commit suicide don't necessarily do it on the spur of the moment uh, they most often are thinking about this and so they'll go through a fairly methodical process of visiting people that they love and care about and mm -hmm. and uh, to say goodbye and that may show up in different uh, sorts of ways. And uh, I, I'm going to be talking about listening uh, quite a bit this morning. And this is a, a situation where you want to listen to what people say. And when you think that they are saying goodbye, whether or not they use that, use those words or not, uh, do, do pay attention to that. And, and giving away prized possessions, things that mean a lot to people, personal possessions, maybe things that they've gotten from uh, other members uh, of the family and, and things that really mean something to them. And so, so uh, giving those away or disposing them of in some fashion is another indicator that a person is suicidal and aggression uh, uh, manifesting itself in the terms of, of, of rage, anger, uh, seemingly, uh, seemingly way beyond proportion to other things that may be uh, occurring in their life. And uh, I already talked about akathisia, which is, a, which is an irritation, an inability to, to uh, sit still. And uh, this is where this is where we might want to introduce Robert. I don't think we've introduced him yet. Okay, and uh, I did, but I'll do it again. Uh, Robert uh, Kimishane, and Robert is a very unique individual, and is going to be with us here in just a moment or two as I introduce him. Uh, Robert has lived in Port Townsend. Uh, quite a while and is a very, very important member of the NAMI community and uh, whose honesty, willingness to share his experience has had a very significant effect on countless lives and helped a lot of people. Uh, Robert is way too modest to mention this, but he's an accomplished poet. And uh, when things get back to normal, to, uh, although in uh, NAMI, we're, we're uh, quick to point out that normal is a cycle on a washing machine. So uh, maybe, that's where, maybe that's where we don't want to go. But Robert, uh, we're, we'll, we'll turn to you now for, uh, to share your own experience, if you will. And I think Val is going to uh, put you into focus. <laughs> so are you there robert i am go uh, ahead this this is yours okay uh first let me see, say that i've done well out of personal experience and out of a lot of research over a number of years i have an enormous amount of material so it took me i've worked over a week or so literally about eight hours to winnow it down and uh, I have it all typed out, so I don't have to pause and hesitate. And uh, so I want to not read too fast because I had a serious injury a couple of weeks ago, and I got to remember to breathe. And also introductory, uh, I do give general information and quotes, but it all applies to my own personal experiences, symptoms, and other things. And one other thing that it's, it's there are similarities uh, between what Patrick has talked about as a causes for suicide and, and ways to deal with it, but there's some very, very different things that uh, distinguish akathisia. So I will start here. Uh, I'm sorry. This is my writing. Hey, hey, Valerie, could we stop screen share so we can better see Robert? Yeah. 
Thank you. Oh, good. Can you see me now? Yeah. It's much better. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so, I'm so sorry. Say, Susanna, oh, you Susanna is still sideways. I don't know if you yeah. can fix that. <laughs> <laughs> it's right, we still love early. you that's not a reflection of our feelings yeah. <laughs> you turn yourself around <laughs> I mean it doesn't bother me but <laughs> thank you it bothers me I can't thank you okay <laughs> sorry Robert <laughs> oh it's okay oh, yeah. huh? <laughs> I'm sorry no, you're not. <laughs> I always rebel when I'm not supposed to talk. <laughs> it would be helpful if everybody would mute, too. Oh, of course. You can go ahead, Robert. Okay. So, akathisia is a drug-induced syndrome, not a mental nor emotional illness. The word in Greek means literally, quote, not to sit. It refers to one of its most noticeable characteristics, the inability to sit still. And I have a quote from one of my research studies, quote, akathisia has been well documented as a common and distressing side effect of antipsychotic drugs and an important cause of poor drug compliance. However, even in psychiatric settings, it is not recognized readily. Patients often find it difficult to explain the inner restlessness or mental unease, as I've known, and the condition may easily be interpreted as acute anxiety or depression. Quote, end quote, another quote. The doctors warn that akathisia, quote, can be one of the most ambiguous clinical diagnostic presentations in all of psychiatry and is often underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed, okay, end quote. Now, although studies have taken place over the years to try to ascertain what neurochemical mechanism causes akathisia, a definitive, an definitive answer has yet to be found. And I have a note, in recent years, antidepressant drugs oh, yeah. have also sometimes been found to cause akathisia. Okay, now the symptoms. The symptoms most recognized, and I've had most of these symptoms myself to extremes more than once in my uh, struggles with mental illness and akathisia. The symptom most recognizable by someone observing a person with akathisia is compulsive movement, shifting from foot to foot, pacing, rocking back and forth, endless fidgeting while sitting in a chair, getting up and sitting right back down or going from one chair to another and back again. However, sometimes the person may hold themselves stiff and still, quote, like a statue sculpted out of stone. Wow. I say, it is difficult, if not impossible, for a person suffering with acute akathisia to convey to others who have not experienced exactly what it feels like internally but I have compiled a list of a few attempts at descriptions by me and others. So here are some that I've experienced and others have and made some attempt to describe. One is intolerable agitation, a living hell, chemical torture, unspeakable anguish, and a quote, I can't stand being inside my own skin. I feel like jumping out of my skin. Fear magnified 100 times. Unrelenting inner restlessness with a compulsive urge to move. Not, it's not fear of anxiety about anything specific, but rather pervasive feeling of dread. And finally, an inability to relax and an urgent need for relief can be expressed. And I have another note. Although not generally mentioned, I have found just two instances of people experience excruciate, experiencing excruciating bodily pain. Now, in the most acute phases of akathisia, quote, the symptoms are so distressing that patients may feel death is a welcome result. Now, I myself suffered with akathisia off and on for 15 years 
and the thought of suicide as a way out never even entered my mind. This is very significant. But when it finally did, I made an attempt after only a few hours, no chance to tell anybody or think much about it at all. And the, the details of that will have to come out another time. In some cases, at least, there may not be any warning signs prior to someone's making an attempt at taking their own life. So my takeaway is that the key is to pay attention for family members, other people involved, and medical people, recognize signs of akathisia as early as possible before matters get to the most extreme place. And so I've made a compilation here of things to watch for that indicate a chronic lower grade phase of akathisia. So it can be recognized and hopefully dealt with before it gets to the, the real extreme uh, danger of actual suicide. And these periods may go on for as much as months, even years, without being correctly identified as akathisia. Now, here's a list. Lack of emotional affect. Hardly any expressions of feeling at all. And some of you who know somebody with it might have noticed this, recognized and not known what it is. Another is cognitive dullness. That means someone who is usually very bright and intellectually adept might not be able to understand even simple things. And there's very much little verbal communication. I say, I could think of nothing much to say about anything, even the weather and a loss of creativity. As Patrick mentions, I've been very involved in creative arts of many kinds, but when I was suffering from this continuing low-grade akathisia, I couldn't write, draw, paint, dance, or any of the things I normally did regularly. And there's extreme loss of ability to concentrate. I had this very much. I couldn't read, I couldn't even listen to music and concentrate enough. Wow. Those are instances. And there's avoidance of any physical exertion. I mean, I went for years sometimes with hardly taking a walk around the block. I was so afraid and so well having these effects. And there's also avoidance of any social interaction. We can't hardly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want friends to come over because I just felt so frustrated that I could not interact with them and offer anything at all. And finally, wanting to or refusal to take medications. Now, often when people do this, they're thought, well, you know, they don't recognize their illness. They don't want to, quote, get better. It's just so disturbing. But very often in akathisia, it's because they are, the effects are so devastating. So all this being said, there, there are any things that, are there any things that can be done to help prevent someone suffering with akathisia for attempting to take their own life? And... So one professor of psychiatry at the University of California says something I saw written, quote, we know that anxiety and akathisia create a sense of hopelessness, especially if the feelings are not validated. Now, this is something that can be done. Explaining to patients that their emotional turmoil may be caused by a drug side effect can alleviate their distress. And another point I want to make emphatically is that education is very, very important of family members, other people close to someone who may be suffering with akathisia, and medical psychiatric practitioners who might, might not be so familiar with it. I think this is essential for there to be any chance of helping to prevent someone from making an attempt at taking their own life. And as for medical intervention, someone may be, when someone may be at risk, the worst possible measure is the mistake of presenting symptoms as indicative of a mental emotional problem and to increase the dosage of antipsychotics. This happened to me that led to my suicide attempt or even some, in some cases antidepressants, excuse me. So over the years, I found by my studies, numerous medications have been tried to antedate antidote the effects of akathisia. Some have sometimes been more or less effective, but I quote, quote, even when akathisia is correctly diagnosed, there are limited therapeutic options and the evidence supporting the most widely used treatments is still absent or inconsistent. More com comprehensive work is clearly needed for this critical problem. 
And I say again, from my own experience, I can offer some hope in all this, you know, devastating experiences and, and lack of some education and uh, information. So I said, over a period of time, I have found that I have been able to reduce, even eliminate the phenomenon of akathisia from occurring. By working closely with medical psychiatric providers and holistic health personnel, I have successfully used the quote, complementary medicine approach of minimal antipsychotic medication combined with a wide variety of holistic treatments and practices. I don't have the time here to discuss in detail what these are. That's for another presentation. But if anyone would like to contact me for further information, if it's okay with Val or Brian, they can give you my email address. And in conclusion, although I don't have anywhere near the time to go into details, I do want to say this. My intention here is not to demonize antipsychotic medications. In one instance, they did nearly lead me to take my life, but another, in another, when I was just as close to death, one of these substances saved my life. So we must all scientists, medical practitioners, and those of us intimately involved with akathisia in one way or another, go on with the hope of someday finding real relief from this devastating disease. And I'm writing a memoir about my experience with schizophrenia over many years and these things. And the title will be Nightlight, A Story of Hope in the Darkness of Chronic Mental Illness. So that's what I have to offer the most. With all I've said in this and schizophrenia, there is hope and we must keep to that hope no matter what. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Robert. And uh, I, I'm especially remember what you said. It's that double-edged sword where at one point the medication seems to save your life, but at another point it could take your life. So that that's important to, uh, to know. And the other thing is, Robert, if you like, you can um, click on that chat button and put your email there. If anyone is interested, they can email you for more information. So, okay, well, if one thing, when I get really like this, really excited, nervous, my hand shakes. So it would be easier, I'll try, but it'd be easier if people could contact you or Brian to get it, but I'll try. Okay, great. Thanks so much. You're welcome. So now I'm going to go back and pick up where we left off with the um, screen share here. And um, we're going to talk about this. This is the basics about suicide and a suicidal person. The first thing is that most suicides are preventable. And uh, in a lot of cases, if we don't know the person is suicidal, then we can't put that prevention or intervention into action. Suicide can seem to represent a very logical solution to ending the unbearable pain in the mind of the person who is affected. That's a very logical solution to them. But there is no type of suicidal person. So if you wanna make a profile, it doesn't always work. What Robert talked about was akathisia and akathisia is actually a symptom of uh, the medication that comes from the um, introduction of medication, but not all people who are suicidal are on medication. So it's not always the same. So the information from today's training can be applied to anyone you know, whether they're on medication or not, and whether they um, actually have their own mental illness or not. So we're looking at five common myths about suicide. The first one is that suicide only affects individ individuals with a mental health condition, and that's not always true, especially if there is an incident that precipitates the immediate thought of suicide. It's not happening to a person who has necessarily been diagnosed with a mental health condition. It's happened when a person is uh, presented with a particular incident. 
and I'll just share this with you. Um, my, my son was killed in a plane crash and that was the type of incident that precipitated um, my own suicidal ideation. So it wasn't that I already had a mental health condition, it was an incident that happened that caused me to begin thinking about it. The second myth is once an individual is suicidal, he or she will always remain suicidal. And that is of course not true. So for example, being suicidal is not a diagnosis and it doesn't remain with you for the rest of your life like diabetes. The next myth is that most suicides happen suddenly without warning, and that's not true either because some people think about it, talk about it for long periods of time before they actually attempt. And I just wanted to interject here. We've been talking about committing suicide, but what we are starting to tell people now is that commit is actually a verb that has to do with um, committing a crime, say, for example. So instead of saying that, we're going to start saying, um, take their own life instead of committing suicide because it um, has that connotation about it being a crime, actually was a crime for many, many years. Another myth is that people who die by suicide are selfish and they take the easy way out. And for it's suicide is not easy. And it is uh, what they perceive as a way to relieve the pain. And none of that is easy. The final myth is that talking about suicide will lead to and encourage suicide. And I'll give you an example of, I worked in the schools for about 35 years. And for a long period of time, we had a um, piece of our health curriculum that talked about suicide and talked about how to intervene with someone who was su suicidal. And then back in the 90s, there was a series of suicides that happened in the state of Washington and all the schools got together and decided they weren't gonna talk about suicide in their health classes anymore because they believed talking about it led to suicide. And research has proven that that is not true. If you talk about it, you prepare people to support each other and to help each other. So, what we're going to do is talk about how we talk to someone who is thinking about suicide. And that's the most important role that we all have here. And what we're going to be following is an acronym that was developed by the University of Washington School of Social Work. And that is the LEARN acronym. So uh, that acronym is the steps that you can follow to be uh, pre help prevent and intervene in cases of suicidation. So we're gonna start with uh, Patrick on the first part of the acronym, look. Oh, thank you, Val. And, and Robert, uh, thank you to you. You're, you're very brave. Uh, it's, uh, and, and another mark of, uh, before I go on here, uh, I just wanna say Robert is one of the most gentle people uh, I've ever met. Uh, it's a characteristic that I have deep admiration for and deep respect for. And so Robert, thank you for your very heartfelt and, uh, and uh, accurate uh, description of, of the things that you talked about. Uh, let's go back to uh, look again. It's a it's a great acronym. I like acronyms, and this one really helps. So uh, some of these we've talked about, but we want to come back and and reemphasize that. And this is all based upon uh, look, uh, pay attention, uh, depression and or anxiety. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to tell a, to see if a person is depressed, especially people that have chronic depression, but pay attention and uh, uh, they'll be lethargic and uh, not very interested in anything else and sleep a lot 
and, and so on. Uh, we've mentioned anger and irritability. Uh, I'm, I talked about my twin brother and I lived a long ways away, so I wasn't always uh, present when these went on, but he was a very, very angry guy. Uh, hopelessness, uh, things will never get better or, or helplessness. Um, uh, I knew a guy, uh, Oh, probably in his mid fifties, he had a wonderful position as a counselor at a terrific, terrific college, just a, a, a great guy. And then he uh, took his gun and shot himself one day. And, and uh, all of those who knew him were act, uh, absolutely stunned. Uh, a real driver of, of issues in our lives of mental illness is shame. And uh, we haven't always talked about that, but shame has a profound impact on, on life. Uh, on our lives. I would commend you to a, a person named uh, Brene Brown, B-R-E-N-A-E, -E, I think, Brown, who has one of the most watched uh, uh, TED Talk videos and, and, and talks about shame and the imp impact that it has on people's lives. And of course, adjacent to shame is humiliation, uh, uh, being made fun of in whatever form it, it manifests. And, and uh, so shame and, and uh, humiliation are key factors uh, in, in uh, perhaps pushing people to suicide. And then uh, Val talked about triggering events uh, with, her, with her son, uh, loss of, and then there are other triggering events, uh, loss of uh, relationships, uh, self-respect, losing a job, uh, taking, experiencing some profound financial difficulty, uh, losing your status uh, in the community and in your family and with people around you. These are all factors that don't necessarily uh, uh, cause one to want to take their own lives, but they also uh, are factors. Uh, death of a family member, uh, a close friend, or a peer, uh, especially by, by, uh, by, by suicide. And uh, I know that all of us have experienced the death of someone in our lives, sometimes suddenly, uh, sometimes uh, near their end of their life by natural causes. And of course, today uh, with what's going on uh, with, the, with the COVID uh, virus. And uh, then there's a euphoric aspect of it, uh, getting really excited about, about uh, some, uh, some event, whatever it is, after a period of, of depression. And, and that can be an issue, that can be an issue as well. And uh, let's see, and then there, and then some other behaviors, uh, increased use of drugs and alcohol. And remember, we're calling these, and I think legitimately so, uh, co-occurring uh, disorders. And, um, and I would dare say, and I think with a degree of accuracy, in the majority of, of cases, there is uh, substance abuse that accompanies uh, depression or whatever mental illness the individual is uh, having. Isolation. Um, I've known a couple of folks who all of a sudden they disappear. Uh, they've been around for a while. And then if we follow up, we find that they're they're cloistered in their bedroom or, or staying away from people. So isolation is something that, that you should pay close attention to. And no one, no one is a better observer of family members and friends than you. So, so trust your observation powers. Uh, uh, pay attention to what's going on with the people uh, in your lives. Um, suicide uh, or journaling, writing notes uh, are, are common ways that people share their feelings, uh, particularly of burdens or, or failures. While seemingly obvious, uh, some of these things become more pronounced when a person is considering taking their own life. Uh, we've, we've talked a bit about giving away prized possessions. These are things that have an emotional meaning to us, uh, things that people have possibly had for a very long period of time. So if all of a sudden you're the recipient of a, of a much loved uh, picture or uh, an object of some kind from someone in your life uh, that is totally unexpected. It doesn't mean for a moment that they're that they're uh, likely to to take their own lives. Uh, if they're depressed, it 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 does serve as a, a warning sign. And uh, losing interest in activities is is something that that people who are going to take their own lives will often manifest uh, as well. People who have been involved. Uh, in the community or in their family or uh, out and about and, and then th th they don't do that anymore. And, and, and that can be an observable uh, activity. And then uh, something that, that 
always catches uh, my my attention in a startling, in a very very startling way, is when when people say the world the world would be better off without me, or uh, you'll miss me when I'm gone. When I'm gone. Now it's important to say that that many people who are going to take their own lives don't do that. They don't say that they're they're the world would be, will be better off without them. That you're going to miss me when I'm gone. But if they do say that. Uh, make sure that you're paying very, very close attention to what is is uh, going on. And uh, you can find just about anything on Facebook, a lot of things that you don't want to find. Uh, but we do have an example here that, that uh, Val has uh, brought up on your screen there. And this comes from a person named Lauren Davis, who is very, very brave. And, or, or actually, I think, is, uh, I don't know the details behind this, uh, but a person who... Uh, is sharing uh, observations about suicide, and it begins with sometimes you just won't, you just don't want to wake up and and uh, face the day. It's just it's just uh, too much for you, and and creates uh, a, a real lethargicness, and you you just want to sleep all the time or or isolate or stay away from from everything, and and so there there is an example of that. I don't know if that goes on or not, Val. Does it? Yep. No, it doesn't. But um. I'm going to go back one because if you get on a Facebook post, do you see where the box says, this is where you click to report posts you are worried about? It may be someone that you really don't know or don't know very well, but there is a place on Facebook where you can report posts like this that um, might appear to be suicidal or um, tipping people off, giving a clue or whatever, there is a way to report those on uh, Facebook. Anna, as you well know, our younger generation are really um, good at being connected on social media, especially now since um, they've been shut in because of the coronavirus. So the next uh, uh, letter that we're looking at in the LEARN acronym is empathize. And you have to listen in order to empathize. You have to hear what they're saying. So even if it's hard for you to hear, you have to keep listening. That is the key thing. You have to also avoid judgment and maintain calm. And then reflect back only on the things they have told you. So if you're giving a reflective response, what you're doing is telling them that you're hearing what they are saying and that you are understanding what they are saying. So here are some helpful responses in your listening role. Tell me more about that. Or you must really be hurting. I hear that you're in a lot of pain. That, those are all uh, on that second line there, reflective responses, because what you are doing is reflecting back to them. I hear that what you're saying is that you're in a lot of pain. And then I love you no matter what, it's okay to tell me what you're going through. So that empathic part of it is reminding them that you still care about them and that it's okay for them to continue talking about it. Or I'm worried about you, I want to help. So um, empath empathizing can be hard, but these are some things that we try to stay away from. Interpreting the situation from our perspective versus theirs. So for example, if they say, uh, you know, I'm sick and tired of the kids at school that are bullying me. If for you to come back and say, yeah, I remember when I was in school and they used to, okay, that's from your perspective. They're not interested in your perspective. What they're trying to do is to communicate to you what they're feeling. Another thing to avoid is panicking or judging or getting angry. For example, well, you have no right to be angry about that or you have no right to feel that way. Those are things that you should not do. Or offering to fix the program. And my favorite example is um, <laughs> of what not to say down on the bottom. Well, let me get you something to eat. That'll make you feel better. 
the you can't fix the problem with the donut. The other thing is asking why questions. We, we avoid asking why questions. Um, ones that are asking, well, uh, why did you feel that way? Sometimes they don't know why they feel that way. If you ask what happened that made you feel that way, it's a different question. And then being in denial, my son or daughter would not think about suicide or whoever. I mean, you may hear information from someone else about suicidal ideation that uh, refers to someone and you think, ah, they'd never be thinking about suicide. Never discount that. Another example of what not to say is, it'll all be okay, don't worry about it. It'll all be just fine. And she wasn't right for you anyhow. And obviously referring to maybe a breakup of a relationship. And so what you're doing is making excuses for the breakup and that doesn't work either. And then the, the why question, here it is. Why do you feel this way? They don't know why they feel this way. They just feel that way. It may be a result of something that happened or um, it could be uh, something that just came to them out of the blue. So on the one hand, we look back here, we have things that are helpful responses, but then we need to remember here that are things that we must avoid and things that we shouldn't be saying. So now we're on to the A, Patrick. Okay, uh, Val's already mentioned and I want to, I want to reiterate, uh, ask about, about suicide. Don't be hesitant to, to, to ask. We're, we're repeating a lot of things that are very, very important, uh, but uh, don't be afraid to ask about uh, suicide. Uh, ask in a way that invites a, a, an honest response um, and uh, doesn't lead to a yes or, or no kind of thing. Uh, and then, then avoid phrases like, you're not thinking about suicide, are you? Well, uh, that gives a person a bit of an option there to say no. And of course, it's, it's very likely that they, that they would say no. no. Uh, don't be shy about using the word uh, suicide or are you thinking about killing yourself or, or uh, are you, uh, and uh, just be frank about it, uh, be forward about it. And, and render these, of course, in a helpful, uh, I, like to, I like to use the word gentle sort of way, not in an accusatory sort of way, not in, a, not in a, an angry uh, sort of way. And so uh, try to be as, as calm about all of this as you, as you possibly, possibly can. Uh, there are, uh, to go back to statements that, that you ought to avoid or, or think about doing something stupid, well, to that person, uh, suicide is not stupid. It's a, it's a way out of uh, a very painful uh, statement. And while some of these may seem obvious, it's important not to use them when you're talking to, to a person who uh, is, uh, has made it clear that they're thinking about killing themselves. Are you thinking about not being here is, uh, is another one. Now, having done all of that, having done all of that, uh, and, and hopefully uh, inviting uh, a response from a person who is thinking about taking their own lives, be prepared to hear it when they say yes. Uh, and they could well be, uh, say yes, and that, that would put you uh, back on your heels. And that's what this workshop and, uh, and other learning and educational opportunities are all about so that you are not necessarily surprised, but at least you're in a position where you can respond affirmatively and not not uh, not cause the person to to uh, becoming uh, cause the person to to react in a way that that uh, perhaps will will complicate the the situation. Uh, when you notice some of the symptoms that that we've already talked about, agita agitation, anger, isolation, losing interest in, in uh, life, uh, isolating, when you notice multiple warning signs together, that's a that's a obvious opportunity to ask the person if they're thinking about about committing committing or excuse me, I'm I'm using that word that we've used so often <laughs> about taking their own 
taking their own lives. So do pay attention to that. And, and uh, when, uh, when you notice, when you notice uh, that there are, there are concerning changes in a, in a person's life, and we've talked about those, and I did just a, a, a moment ago. So do pay close attention to that. Observation and listening are so key uh, here. And uh, those of us who, who have someone in our lives who has a mental illness, uh, learn uh, over time to pay close attention to their changes in their, in their behavior. So don't take a change in a behavior or bringing those multiple warning signs together uh, as something that's, that's within the norm because they're, they're not. Uh, in NAMI, we are emphatic about trusting your, your gut instincts. Trust your gut. Uh, uh, don't let uh, convention uh, ride over what, what your instincts are telling you. Uh, uh, that's very, very uh, important. And it's better to check than to suppress the, the, what, what your gut is telling you, what your, what your instincts are telling you. And, and uh, your gut and your instincts, um, and I'm using those words a lot, will, you, will tell you that there is something different going on this time. Uh, to reiterate the point, uh, it, it's never harmful, never harmful uh, to ask about suicide. Suicide is not a word that is, is uh, to be avoided. And uh, if you're unsure, which many of us are, uh, because we don't want to aggravate the situation or, or cause harm, if you're on the fence or if you're doubtful, ask. Go ahead and ask. It's better to ask than to not ask if we want to, to uh, you know, prevent that, uh, help prevent that person from, from taking their own, their own life. And that, uh, uh, one thing I just, I, I do want to add before we go on to uh, a couple of scenarios is you will not be responsible uh, if that person goes on to, to take their life. Uh, that's not a responsibility that, that, that is yours. Uh, it's not your fault. And so uh, while being sensitive, don't worry about, about asking about suicide and then that individual does, uh, uh, does go and take their own life. So, so uh, just don't worry about that. Um, and let's see, now let's go to the scenarios. Uh, your daughter, Megan, as you can see there, has seemed very anxious lately. She worries about the smallest of things and has a panic attack at school uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so a warning sign, uh, uh, overreacting to the seemingly smallest things. Uh, it's not always an indication that a person wants to take their own life, but a, a disproportionate reaction to what uh, appears to be the smallest thing. I will add that that we might think it's the smallest thing, but but uh, that person may not think it's the the smallest thing. So we want to be careful about laying our own perceptions over uh, over someone else. Uh, another uh, indication: she doesn't hang out with her friends anymore uh, on weekends, and and uh, while a brilliant musician, having been in the band for a long time, uh, she isn't excited about the upcoming band concert. Uh, we know that, that most of us develop some kind of anxiety when it comes to a performance. I'm, I'm told by uh, many people who have been doing this for a long time that sure they get anxious about it. Uh, but when, uh, when there's not excitement about something coming up that, you really, that that person really cares about, that, that could be an indication that they are they're thinking about, about taking their own life. Uh, not always, but something to pay attention to and, and something to uh, something that you make you want to make sure that that you that you listen to, and uh, I think that is probably the end of that scenario. Uh, well, yeah, the the questions are on the bottom. How would you empathize? That is, what might you say to Megan? And this is an opportunity for uh, the participants here to maybe write something in the chat. I can't get in the chat because I'm, I'm uh, screen sharing here, but you can, you can click on the chat button and write some statements that are empathic statements, maybe reflective response and so forth that you think might be helpful in this kind of situation. And we'll take a look at some of these. So I'm gonna turn this screen share off and see what those of you have to say. So uh, Brian, 
Yes. Maybe you can um, read for us some of the examples of uh, mm. what empathic statements are that people are making. By the way, um, I. I notice now that I have stopped the screen share that I can see the uh, chat that Robert has put his email on the chat for everyone if they wanted to email him um, and get some more information about akathisia. So Denise wrote in the chat that she said, I might ask her if she wants to talk. Mm -hmm. And Sean just wrote, would you like to talk about anything that is bothering you? I got another response that said, Megan, I'm concerned about you. Would you like to talk? So those are all good examples of inviting the person to talk and you know if you don't ask sometimes they're not going to offer more information they'll just tell you things are going bad i hate my life at school or whatever but inviting them to talk is really important hmm. i noticed denise had a follow-up which sounds like an observation she said uh, maybe say seems like you're struggling for what it's worth, my own my own thought on it would have been to, yeah to um, name the thing I'm noticing, which is Megan. It seems like you're not as interested in the things you normally are, like your your concert or your your school activities. How have you been feeling lately? Or that's unusual for you, Megan. Or is everything okay? Sean also wrote in the chat, uh, would you like to go for a walk somewhere? Which sounds like it might be an opportunity for what it's worth. I know, especially with young people, for when I've worked with young people, if you can get them in a car <laughs> or if you can walk alongside them, it feels a lot less, I don't know, maybe confrontational and, and tend to, to talk more. So if you have that opportunity and then you can start asking some of these good questions that people are putting in the chat. Okay, and these are, are some definitely some good ideas that would be good responses um, to go with this particular situation. Uh, another scenario is um, after an empathic conversation with Megan and lots of listening, you find out that she's feeling very lonely at school. Okay, she's given you her feelings. And she also tells you, I hate my life. So now we're talking about asking the big question. The big question is, how would you ask Megan about suicide? So I'm gonna take this off the screen and see if people can kind of come up with some statements or, or questions, the actual question, if you're asking someone about suicide. If you don't practice formulating those questions, you're not comfortable doing it. So that's what we're trying to do. How would you ask someone if they're thinking about suicide? Mm -hmm. um. Megan, I'm concerned about you feeling or I'm concerned about you seeming to be so sad. Are you considering taking your own life? Yeah, and that's that's a great question because it actually had two parts. The first part is that you recognized that um, what her feelings are, and then you asked the big question. Mm -hmm. So that's a good way to approach it. I see a couple in the chat here. 
uh, there was a private chat that said, uh, Megan, that sounds so painful. Are you thinking about suicide? And another one, uh, the question was, do you want to hurt yourself or do you have a plan to hurt yourself? Anybody else want to jump in there? I think for my part, what I, what I would say is very similar to what people are already putting in here, which would be just to say, um, yeah, Megan, I'm concerned about you. Are you thinking about killing yourself? It's, it's a hard question to ask. It doesn't, it feels like, whoa, like you used to use the word killing yourself. Like, yeah, oh, that's too much. But they'll tell you that they're not thinking about it. Um, and, Sean also, and, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Sean also wrote, I have noticed you have been bothered by some things lately. Are you feeling like ending your life in any way? So that's another way, um, a softer way of saying killing yourself, but it's still saying the same thing. What if they say, no, no, I'm not, and completely deny it when you know perfectly well they have, they're showing all the signs. How, how can you break through that, that barrier? Question, good question. So when, that's when you come back with what you are actually seeing. And what you're actually seeing is the signs and symptoms that we talked about earlier. You're seeing them not doing their normal things like going to the band concert or hanging out with their friends or even spending time uh, uh, with family or whatever it is behavior that you're seeing. And you have to reflect that back to them to let them know that what you're seeing is not their normal behavior or their normal mood. So even if they say no, it's possibly no, they haven't been thinking about it. Then it's time to talk about, okay, well, what we're seeing here is this kind of behavior. And this is why I'm concerned about you. So then you have, you go right back to the conversation about the symptoms that you're looking at. Hmm. Okay, there's, a, I see another chat there. I think uh, Susanna was kind of reflecting on, on how, how we're learning um, in our training today. I was going to say, say a very similar thing, Val, in response to Shirley, uh, Shirley's question, which, which was to, re to reflect what I'm seeing. Uh, because if I, if I ask that question, are you thinking about killing yourself? Are you thinking about suicide? Um, and they say, no, 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 no. And then I can say, oh, okay, well, the reason I'm asking is because here's what I'm noticing. Yeah. This is, you, usually you behave this way, but I'm, I'm seeing this right now. So can you help me understand what's going on? You know, I care about you. And and continue to empathize. Um, and there's there's resources and support for people who are feeling, you know, uh, if it's if it's pain, if it's uh, you know depression, if it's whatever it is, we can get folks that support. Um, our job here in the training, of course, is to is to assess is this person in imminent uh, danger of harming themselves. And I, I just might add that that you don't want to abandon that you don't want to push the person into a corner, but but don't abandon uh, that interaction with that person. And as Brian mentioned, we'll be we'll be talking about some resources here momentarily. But but be gentle and and uh, and firm about it uh, without without uh, uh, the person's already under stress. Uh, so but try not to to uh, to uh, to create more, if you will, but but don't abandon uh, that that interaction until you know until you know that person is is safe or you feel that they're safe. So I want to point out this one um, answer that uh, someone or questions that someone um, asked here: Do you want to hurt yourself, or do you have a plan to hurt yourself? 
And that is really an important question to ask because um, then that tells you how you can move forward. So for example, if they're talking about pills, you know that we're going to remove the access to pills in the house or weapons or whatever, but you have to ask the question. If, if you know what the plan is, then you can help uh, make preparations to make things safe for that person. So now I'm gonna- I got a uh, private chat with a question that said, um, if they do not want to speak, what can you do? Yeah. You can tell them like uh, Sean was talking about and how you did this so well, Brian. Tell them what you're seeing. The reason I'm asking is that, you know, I'm seeing this and that. Uh, and, and it's different from what you normally do or what you're normally saying. So keep that conversation going about what kind of behaviors that you see. And then of course, there's that, um, is there anything that I can do to help make things better for you at school or uh, with your brother or, or, or? And so you can keep that conversation going, even though they might deny that they're thinking about suicide and they don't, they think you stepped over the line there, you still can have that conversation about what you're seeing, what kind of behavior you're seeing. So I'm going to move on to um, the, the big ask. So Megan, sometimes when people are feeling very anxious, losing interest in their activities and withdrawing from friends, they're thinking about suicide. Are you thinking about suicide? Well, that's exactly like the questions that you were all posing and coming up with yourself. And so what we normally do if we get to meet in person and it's not coronavirus, we break up into groups or pairs and we'd have people practicing with each other. And it's a little different on Zoom, but that's exactly what we did when you were contributing things in that uh, chat box. So if the person says yes, one, take it seriously. Two, acknowledge the pain the person must be in and thank them for their honesty and courage in telling you. It takes a lot of courage to admit any of it. It takes a lot of courage to admit that their lives are not going well, that things are not happening the way they planned it. It, it takes a lot of courage to talk about that, but sometimes just mm -hmm. the very act of discussing it can help them feel better. So you have follow-up questions you can ask if the person says yes. And this is what someone did in the chat just a moment ago. Have you thought about how you might end your life? And do you have access to those means? So when you get that, you wanna remove the danger. You don't wanna wait, you want to remove it. So here is a little bit of information about the time frame. This is what they've discovered that once a person actually makes the decision to attempt to take their own life, 24% of them do it within five minutes. 48% of them do it in less than 20 minutes. And 71% of them do it within an hour. So at best, you have an hour to get a plan together and to be able to uh, do some intervention here. So it may be that this person has made the decision before you talk to them. So maybe you don't have an hour. It may be that this person has made the decision right now. So what I'm saying is that it's an immediate thing. 
you need to be able to take some immediate action. One of the things that you can do is make your house suicide safer if, if there is such a thing. And that is um, remove firearms, alcohol and drugs, prescription medications, even over-the-counter medications, belts, ropes, cords, plastic bags, knives, chemicals, cars and car keys. Um, sometimes people would just jump in the car and decide that's going to be how they take their own life. And even pesticides and poisons. So that is, you get the yes answer that should be one of the first things you're thinking about if this person is in fact in your home. So you need to remove the danger and ask yourself, is it safe and appropriate for me to remove or restrict these dangerous items? That is, is it your house or is it someone else's house? You can't just walk into someone else's house and start removing items, but you can if it is your own house. So lock things up, dispose of them, remove them from the home and restrict access to, for example, cars, because you can take your own life in a car by driving it or just by locking it up in the garage and turning it on. And then um, finally, you want to look at it this way. If this person were intoxicated, too intoxicated to drive, you would ask them to give you the keys to your car and you'd get them a ride. You would remove the danger. So that's exactly what you're doing if you are removing the danger by removing firearms, alcohol, drugs, knives, chemicals. All those things are the same that would same things that would be happening if they were too intoxicated to drive. You you might even take their keys away from them. Val, we got so, a question in the chat that okay. I, I know we're running close to the end on time, but the question mm -hmm. was, uh, what are the statistics on teens killing themselves with their parents' guns? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. And I'll bet you the CDC would have an answer to that. I did not include that kind of statistic in this class because we already have so many, but that is really a good question. I'll bet it's pretty high. Don't have the answer to that. So now we're at the last letter of the LEARN acronym, Patrick. Uh Yes. Now, next steps, and that has to do with uh, resources that that are uh, available to you. And Val is showing those on the on the screen. If a person is in immediate danger, what do you do? You call nine one one. Call nine one one. Don't hesitate. It's better uh, to have something not happen than it is to have something happen and uh, not have called 911. 911 is there for a reason. It's uh, and the folks who answer those calls, uh, anybody that's called 911 knows this. The folks who answers those calls, the dispatchers very quickly uh, assess the situation and then uh, get in touch with first responders and other people that will be there to to help. Now there's also a national suicide prevention line uh, that you can call if it, if 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 it appears that the person is uh, not going to take their own life uh, within I think Val said uh, five minutes and that's tough to assess. Uh, with that person present, call the National Suicide Prevention Line, and you can see the number there, 1-800-273-8255. So copy that down, put it on your refrigerator. Uh, and uh, we have little cards that I'm going to take over to the Recovery House Cafe and leave with Brian that have all of this information on here. And uh, there is also a, a local resource that that you can call, and uh, that that number is a regional hotline, and it's being shown there that in its in its staff 24 hours a day, and the number is 1-88-910-0416, and uh, it's Volunteers of America, a very reputable uh, nonprofit organization that has the has the contract uh, for that, 
and uh, I think they uh, they're anyway. It's originally based uh, workshop, and so that's something that you can uh, pay pay close attention uh, uh, pay close attention to. So keep those numbers handy, and if you want them in a more formal way, uh, uh, Brian will have cards there at the Recover House ca uh, Cafe. By the way, um, you as a support person can call these crisis line numbers or get on the chat line to get some support from professionals. And when uh, Patrick told you that the regional crisis line is actually staffed by Volunteers of America, don't be fooled by the word volunteers because they are all professionals, trained and certified professionals. They're not just volunteers who walked in to do this. So um, that is uh, what you have in the local information. The question is, okay, after safety has been established, we already know about the calling, that was step one. Follow up with recommendations provided by the crisis line. And it might be that the crisis line, and this is happening across the country now, the crisis line sometimes can connect you with professionals and, and providers in your local area and help you get set up with an appointment or help your loved one get set up with an appointment. Get the person connected to mental health and or substance abuse treatment. And if it is appropriate, talk to the school counselor. Then, um, so we have been through the whole acronym, the LEARN acronym and we always ask ourselves the questions, okay, next steps, what would you do? Whoops, I went too far on this one. So here is more information for you. The University of Washington has uh, a uh, department that deals only with suicide and that's called Forefront. So you see the website there in the Forefront. Mm -hmm. And then the Suicide Prevention Resource Center is nationwide. There is another crisis text line for, from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and the NAMI helpline, which is Monday through Friday. So hey, there Val, are some- Val, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. it, I pronounce it NAMI. So it's pronounced NAMI? NAMI, NAMI. <laughs> Tomatoes, tomatoes. <laughs> it depends on who you talk to. All right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Patrick, you want to wind things up? Uh, yes, yes. And uh, uh, a special thanks to Val, who really makes this all of this happen. Uh, Val put together the PowerPoint that we've looked at, uh, puts together a, a script, and and uh, uh, talks with with Brian uh, about all this. And so, Val, thank you very much. Val is just tireless. And, Thanks, Val. <laughs> and uh, and so, uh, really, the heart of Nami or Nami. I like uh, it was Nami until I moved to Washington. Then it became Nami, and I've really <laughs> it's uh, it's one of those never ending uh, tomato potato. I think somebody said that. <laughs> and, and, uh, Anyway, so that's that's uh, very very important. And Robert, a special thanks to you as well. It's it's so good to see you. I spent about three minutes with Robert social social distancing in the parking lot uh, where he lives to to give him some information. And Robert, just those thirty seconds helped me feel better. So it was it was very good to see you. And I have a couple. And Brian, uh, we are really liking that partnership that we have with the Recovery House Cafe. And although your windows on your building are still crooked. I don't know if you're going to do anything about that or not. <laughs> I keep asking uh, you to come fix them, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it's probably not at the uh, top of your priority list. And Brian <laughs> is also a member of the NAMI board, and we're very glad to have uh, have him bring his expertise, knowledge, and experience to the work that NAMI is doing. A reminder that we do have support groups uh, on the first and third Wednesdays of, of the month uh, for uh, one is called Connections. That's for for individuals with a mental illness and they gather with others. So they gather with their peers and, and share their stories and, and help one another. We do have a family uh, support group that 
again, meets at 7 p.m. on uh, Wednesdays, uh, the first and third Wednesdays, and that's for uh, people who have a member of their family that has a mental illness or uh, a, a, a significant person in their life, and we invite you to join those. We're doing them over Zoom. There are no, uh, uh, those are all free, and they're facilitated with, with trained uh, facilitators. Uh, after the turn of the year, uh, we are going to be offering what's known as a family, uh, uh, family to family class, family uh, for uh, individuals who have a family member or again, somebody in their lives that has a mental illness. It's an eight week course at no charge. We're gonna be doing all of this on Zoom, uh, I think, unless things change radically, which it doesn't appear that they, they will with the virus. And so uh, when you use Zoom, parking is never a problem and you don't have to leave early to get to where you're, you're going. So there's uh, more information about that on our website. And, and then finally, I wanna draw your attention to a very special event that can, combines uh, art and, uh, and uh, mental illness, if you will. And you can see in the chat box, if you go there, uh, refer to NAMI Washington Presents Brain Power Chronicles at 7 p.m. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, November 21st. And you can uh, gain access uh, to that through uh, Eventbrite. And, uh, or you can also go to NAMIWA.org uh, and find information uh, um, ab about that as well. And this, uh, the performance is about an hour and it consists of six individuals who are going to share their story in uh, roughly 10 minute venues. And I was, uh, uh, I volunteered to be one of those six performers this year, and I will tell you two things. One is uh, my respect for people who, who do this all the time, including Val, who is a musician, and uh, actors, and uh, everybody else has in increased enormously, because it's hard to do to prepare uh, a performance. It's, uh, it's challenging. We worked on it for several months, and then we uh, pre-recorded it on on uh, last week uh, in uh, Kirkland at their performing arts center. Uh, it is a fundraiser. So if you're so inclined, uh, uh, NAMI WA always welcomes uh, contributions, but it's not necessary to make a contribution in order to view the event. Um, we- Patrick, uh, Patrick, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, how long is the event? An hour, two hours? An hour, it'll last about an hour. An hour. Okay. Yeah, that's right. about the extent of my attention span. So I like things that are <laughs> that are a, a, a little bit short. So you can you can go to uh, uh, Eventbrite and just search so and you'll you'll find access to it. Finally, about Brain Power Chronicles, uh, because of the of the COVID virus, uh, we didn't gather as a cast. Uh, so the only uh, I've only met the other five people uh, through through Zoom. But I know from, from having uh, experienced some interaction with them that these are stellar people. Some tell their own stories, uh, some share, share stories about family members and they're all, uh, they're all poignant and, and very, very uh, uh, personal. And I, uh, let's see, uh, let me just check my notes here and see if I have any additional things that I wanna share with you. Uh, I'm just noticing that we have uh, about uh, 20 folks that have zoomed in to, uh, when did Zoom become a verb? Uh, that we've uh, uh, been sharing today's experience with. If you want more information, you can always contact us and we, uh, we will see you around. And, and thank you for your, your interest and your commitment and your love and care for the people in your lives that, that are experiencing mental illness. So Thanks, I, Patrick. I just wanna uh, let people know that um, uh, I'm going to be on this Zoom uh, after other people leave. And if you'd like to hang around and ask some questions, I would be happy to talk with you. Okay. All right, and uh, thanks again, Val. And I can see some of you and, and you're, all, you're all looking really great. So, okay, bye-bye. Okay, I still haven't brushed my hair and I'm not dressed on. <laughs> well, you don't want to overdo it. Bye-bye, okay. everybody. I have a question. Thank you for attending. Question. Question.